So this is Chiku, Sweet <laughs> Panther Ready, and uh, we're talking about his marvelous book, Underworld Lit. The title itself gives us a very useful pun to think about this book, I think. Uh, in the sense of a lit up underworld, an underworld for us to see, and um, underworld literature, and, and certainly the study of literature and the way that academic life proceeds to enter or not enter literature is one of the subjects of his book, a kind of novel in verse. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good way to <laughs> kind of, uh, you know, you uh, <laughs> Why don't you tell us about the form of the book? Sure, sure. Um, well, so maybe I'll start by saying like how the book kind of happened, um, uh, which is a story I've told a couple of times uh, uh, before um, about the book. Uh, and it kind of dates back to the summer of 2008. Uh, <clears throat> So this book was a long time in the making. It, it was about uh, seven or eight years in the writing and uh, addresses a time in my life from even before then. When my wife, uh, the poet Suzanne Buffum, and I were uh, learned that we were expecting a child. Um, <clears throat> this is something we'd been eagerly anticipating and anxious about uh, and trying to make happen for uh, a long time. And so we were like just filled with joy uh, when we learned that Suzanne was pregnant. And uh, then um, three days later, I uh, got a phone call from uh, the University Health Services, uh, the university where I work, uh, informing me that I uh, had a cancer uh, diagnosis um, <clears throat> at a malignant melanoma, which is a nasty uh, kind of cancer to, uh, to confront, um, especially because uh, people with my complexion <laughs> rarely are afflicted with melanoma. Um, so two surprises in uh, a very short period of time that brought um, birth and death into a kind of uncomfortable proximity. Uh, so at the time I was also um, <clears throat> as an untenured junior faculty member at the University of Chicago, uh, who was already kind of living with the daily precarity and anxiety of tenure, uh, which is an underworld of its own. Um, <laughs> you know, about all about that, I'm sure. Um, and so th this kind of threw me into like uh, maybe slightly premature midlife. <clears throat> um, uh, crisis. And I was teaching a class on world literature. It was called Liter Readings in World Literature <clears throat> at the time, trying to process all of these uh, events in my life, my own life, while teaching a classroom full of undergraduates from kind of all over the world uh, <clears throat> about uh, poetry of the ancient world was the unit we were doing. Uh, we're reading epics from the ancient Mesopotamian, um, uh, from India, uh, from uh, um, from a range of cultures. And one thing that uh, I've been thinking a little bit about, even prior to the kind of good and bad news that I'd received, <clears throat> was uh, about this shared feature of all of these epic traditions. Uh, of a descent to the underworld. And as someone who's kind of feeling a little bit thrust into the underworld myself uh, at that point in my life, um, I started to think about underworld lit, <clears throat> not only underworld literature, the literatures of the underworld, uh, but also ways of trying to find illumination in that kind of dark uh, space. Um, so, you know, I didn't start writing until a bit after the, all of these kinds of events had resolved. And fortunately, I'm, I'm okay health-wise, and my daughter is now 12 years old. Uh, and, um, but uh, after a little time uh, to reflect, I started to uh, try and tell the story of a bad year um, through this um, book-length uh, poem 
Uh, you, you, yeah. yeah, I'm thinking about the, uh, you sort of draw a line between uh, melanoma and melancholy in one of the sections of the book. And <laughs> so is, is this long poem in a way an investigation of, of, of melancholy, of, of entering into an underworld within oneself? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I'm so glad you make that connection um, because I think I'm, uh, despite my sunny disposition, I'm a kind of melancholic. Um, <laughs> we never know. <laughs> we cover it well. Uh, yeah, well, you know, I, I'll start, I'm sure I'll get morose at some point in this interview, Mark. <laughs> but um, so I think that, yes, uh, one, as I was writing the book, I uh, got interested in etymologies, false etymologies, real etymologies, um, the kind of like desire to find an etymology, a kind of knowledge. Um, <clears throat> and I think that um, one thing, the most interesting, one of the most interesting uh, things about language that I learned while I was reading <clears throat> in the writing of this book was that our word for uh, the descent into the underworld, catabasis, um, all has a range of other meanings, uh, including a kind of depression that young men uh, experience oh. at a certain point in their lives, um, uh, recovery from an illness, a, a strong Im immune response to an illness. Um, and I think that all of those things were bound up for me uh, when thinking about the underworld. Uh, Could you describe a little bit that what, what the underworld was for you as you conceived of it in this book? You know, everybody's underworld looks considerably different and reflects a sense of cosmology and, and of the structure of the self too. Absolutely. Dante to, to Gilgamesh to, uh, you know, who knows what, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, you, you point out one of the most fascinating things about uh, the underworlds uh, of different cultures, which is that they're all quite different. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we come to the idea of the underworld from kind of the Judeo-Christian tradition of thinking of it as a place of damnation, punishment, judgment, hellfire, uh, <clears throat> and so on. Uh, but the uh, late imperial Chinese underworld uh, is actually a place of um, like political, it's like a huge uh, corrupt legal system where you pass from one kind of appellate court to another, um, bribing officials uh, with money that your living relatives have burned, uh, you know, in, in the world above. And um, it's a vast bureaucracy, right? So that reflects something about uh, <clears throat> Chinese uh, society of the period. Um, the classical Mayan underworld looks very different from the Chinese or the Judeo-Christian underworld. Uh, it's a place of bloody athletic contests um, where uh, the hero twins descend and play uh, this ancient ball game that culminates in human sacri sacrifice that has lots of kind of political implications for like Central America today, right? The, the, the violence and genocidal uh, politics. Uh, the Cold War period. Uh, and so I could go on and on, you know, you can kind of think about uh, these cosmologies kind of comparatively. Um, and yet there's also a deep commonality, right? Um, this is a feature of all of these literatures, this uh, descent and reemergence. Uh, for me in my own life, the underworld kind of looked, uh, my own kind of profane underworld, it looked like, um, uh, trips to the library, <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, where you where you where you take the the elevator down to like level B two and emerge into this dark, uh, dimly lit labyrinth of movable stacks, uh, where they they light up as you walk through, but then right. the lights come out behind you. Nobody's been there for a long time, right? Yeah, and and the people who are there are the dead. Do, do, is there some element of, of uh, fantasy <laughs> films, novels, comic books in there too? It, it seemed like I was picking up on that kind of, of imagery as well as, uh, you know, frighteningly desolate academic locations. Totally, totally. And, you know, I think my first introduction to the underworld was as a super nerdy kid growing up in the suburbs of Chicago, 
um, playing Dungeons and Dragons, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Or uh, video games where you have to, you know, uh, make your way through these um, uh, unlit corridors uh, full of danger, right? Um, and and somehow that um, stayed deep mm -hmm. inside, um, and then kind of, you know burst out with, uh, you know, the, my, in, at midlife in these kind of unexpected ways. Uh, I'm thinking about a storm of bloody skulls that emerges out of the floor in, you know, in a later scene and that kind of thing, which seems um, Spielbergian, but Spielberg quoting images of the past, you know? Yeah, yeah. Joss Whedon was actually uh, someone who was kind of important to me um, yeah. in kind of like world building um, and the passage between worlds uh, of um, kind of uh, that kind of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. uh, but that passage between worlds has been a feature of uh, our literary um, yes. imagination uh, since uh, the, the, its very beginnings. So uh, one of the, the results of that kind of fantasy is, is a certain degree of comic, right? I mean, it's, it's horrific. It's also sort of funny sometimes. And I'm interested in the relationship between the melancholy of this descent and the exploration of, of darkness and how a sense of humor plays off of that or connects to it. Or That's comes great. Out. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there are a lot of ways of thinking about that. One is just the... Um, humor and comedy as a way of like mediating what otherwise feels intolerable right. um, and giving shape to like the real. Um, uh, but I think, uh, and so in a lot of ways, the book is a kind of slapstick uh, journey through the underworld um, that I think kind of reflects the way that I kind of stumbled through my rather unheroic uh, battle with cancer. Um, and with fatherhood and and, and tenure, uh, but also you know I think there's like a, a probably a, like a more uh, lit lit geeky way of thinking about comedy uh, as opposed to tragedy as a kind of worldviews and ways of um, trying to structure experience that uh, Dante in many ways um, kind of. I think is the, in the Western tra literary tradition, the great uh, exemplar of. And so I think in some ways, the comedy writ large, uh, not just as humor and jokes, but as the way of resolving um, kinds of like irreconcilable uh, tensions um, in a way that's that, Yeah, that makes total sense. Would you say that comedy, uh, it puts then less emphasis on the self? That, that, the, that it's more about the, the uh, play of tensions in the world in which the self gets caught up, but not as much concern with individual fate? That's interesting. So, I mean, we can think of tragedy, right, as um, one in which the individual kind of, um, one, one individual's uh, kinds of beliefs uh, mm -hmm. kind of run up against uh, the beliefs of uh, society uh, or a social order and uh, where bo both like famously are right or yeah. both are wrong no there's no right or wrong you know and so that's a very uh, that's a, a way of imagining uh, a self in relation to the world it's very different from the comic um, or the comedic mm -hmm. kind of ends you know, uh, depending on the genre, like in Shakespearean comedy, ends in marriage, right? right, right. Um, uh, uh, and in some ways, in the Shakespearean uh, sense of comedy, uh, it is a, a question not of self and society, but rather of two individual lives kind of um, integrating into a social order, right? Um, Dante is a little bit different because Dante is like very much the hero of his poem. And cheerfully uh, placing people in hell or, or in heaven. Yeah. He, he gets to decide, right? Yeah. I'll never forgive yeah. him for, for the, what he does with his old teacher or what he outs as a sodomite, you know, and it sympathizes with at the same time. What, what are you doing here? You know, it's yes. supported damnation. Yeah, there's, there's kind of like nowhere to hide in comedy, you know, um, 
kind of in every way to think that one thinks about comedy, you have to, um, you out yourself yeah, in yeah. comedy, um, but you're also forced to um, assume a kind of um, position of judgment, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, a very uncomfortable place if mm -hmm. you're a poet, because poetry is, you were, we're told that poetry is about kind of uncertainty and suspension. And empathy. And empathy as well, you know, as opposed yeah. to judgment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's very much Dante's problem in the Inferno and um, and in the subsequent uh, installations of the comedy, and that's something that I felt very much uh, unsettled by mm -hmm. in my own uh, thinking about different political realities in this book. If I were going to to say sort of abstract a principle from from your book, uh, an operating principle, it might be that whatever you apprehend or understand. It's bigger than you think, or, or you won't be right. Is, does that seem accurate to you? <clears throat> yeah, I think that feels really right. I, um, I really enjoyed seeing that played out in the book, how every arrival or understanding is, is sort of crumbles in the face of the next thing. Yes, I think that's, that's, really, yeah. that's really true. That, that, that's uh, the instability that like physically we see in slapstick. Right, right in Chapel, right. Um, where he um, is ice or uh, roller skating, you know, uh, on the edge of um, yeah. various precipices, um, kind of blissfully ignorant of how precarious his right. own uh, movement is. But also, I think, um, you know, epistemologically, or you know, um, or politically, or on. And, or psychologically, on all of these different levels of our um, our passage through the world, um, that kind of un, unknowing, um, or the way one gets kind of knocked off balance by the encounter with other cultures, other persons, um, is very much something that I think kind of structures the book in ways that I I kind of stumbled through in the writing. I didn't have a plan for the book as I was writing it. I, I, I found that the story continually through me. Um, it's great. Off. Uh, it was like, it was like uh, steering into the swerve, uh -huh. uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're Good. Out. That's a great metaphor. Oh, was it fun to write? Or was it, was it? <laughs> it was like, um, you know, it was both immensely pleasurable and uh, excruciating. Um, and part of that was, so that's kind of sounds like a non-answer, but in a way, um, first of all, it took a, a long time. Uh, and uh, it wasn't something that I would put away and come back to. I worked on it kind of every mm. day for those that long period of time and ended up throwing out maybe 10 times as much material as really? already is in this rather lengthy. Uh, How did book. you, uh, what, so what made it take so long? It was, you were, you said you were researching. Were you also <laughs> uncertain about the next step? Or, or? Yes, yeah. yeah, it was being totally uncertain about uh, each step okay. uh, along the way. And so it is, in a way, a narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a narrative that I had to make an enormous number of missteps um, along the way. And in fact, I think that it is a book of missteps. Every, every page is something uh, that I didn't really expect uh, would happen next. Yeah. In conventional terms, too, anything could have happened. The, the, the one section is not necessarily logically coming after the one that has preceded it. It wasn't necessarily causal. Something completely strange or outside the laws of ordinary experience might take place. And that means you had kind of infinite potential reality, which would drive me crazy. Right? If, if anything yeah, could happen, there's so many choices. Yeah. Yeah, I was a little crazy making. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, in some ways, I think that that's like writ small that's what writing a poem uh -huh. uh, feels like right yeah, uh, yeah. if uh, so that by the end of writing a poem or reading a poem that i any poem that i love by another poet when i get to the end i kind of find myself looking up and saying like wait how did i get here from there from that first 
yes. live, right? And it's amazing when one, you're willing to go along or you feel that the voice compels you to continue because it, it's right somehow, or it has a certain authority while you're in the act of reading it, even if you question it later. Yeah, I think, um, okay. I, I think Aristotle mm -hmm. <laughs> says that this is like the, um, the principle of a great plot is that everything that happens in a great plot should feel totally surprising mm -hmm. uh, but in retrospect or even in the real time of the experience also utterly inevitable um, and i think that's what for me that might be a definition of plot but it's also very much how a poem moves from one line to the next it's a better definition of a poem than it is of a plot i think <laughs> I mean, a poem that achieves that is it, done something remarkable, even if we couldn't ever predict or expect exactly how we got there, but we get there and it feels right. Whereas a plot so often, I mean, take the plot of, you know, soap opera, well, of course, this happens and it happens. So. And that's true. That's true. I, I mean, you know, maybe we're thinking of plot uh, as poets, as something that's very structured and shaped right. Right. Um, and contrived. Um, but I think that's, I think that is true. I think that, that, that the lack of premeditation is really important for, for you, poetry. You're right. The, the feeling of uh, surprise arrival, having been lifted from one place to another by some of magical means it is to my mind, a characteristic of a good poem. Yeah. And it, you know, I mean, I think in a way that's what a life looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. um, so hopefully you get lifted in a life, right? Which yeah. you, you certainly pass through this triumvirate of cancer and fatherhood and tenure. Mm -hmm. And here you are. Yeah. Congratulations on that. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. It's really an engaging. I mean, as, as much struggle as it contains, it is also a very gripping, adventurous, unpredictable read. Yeah, well, you know, I think in some ways, um, thank you uh, uh, for that. And, you know, I think uh, translation for me was a way of um, kind of allowing um, that kind of sense of discovery to happen. First of all, finding a book. In, there's, a, there's a long translation in the book. That actually takes over the story and and the narrator's uh, own experience starts to kind of recede further and further into the background as this uh, translation gone gone bad starts to uh, take <laughs> over um, and i think that you know in some ways that sense of um, not knowing what's coming next and um Im immersive immersive um experience in other life worlds yep. um, is what translate I, I discovered that i'm actually became int really interested in translation in the process yeah. of life which is something i wasn't interested in before lots of stories about previous lives and that that in a way is a description of the translation too is that not where you you encounter a life that feels familiar or that somehow mirrors your own though it's uh long gone you know? yeah, the, the, yeah. those those characters that might be you be the historic or fictional you know? yes yeah and um you know, I think another thing that translation um, that I started to come to feel and think about translation in the mm -hmm. process is that translation is also kind of like an um, act of, can be an act of reparation. Oh. Um, and that uh, there's something that felt to me kind of penitential and also restorative uh, about the work of thinking about and imagining and bringing the experience of um, others from very different historical periods, very different cultures, geographical regions um, into, uh, into my language. So you're bridging a distance and also perhaps um, both the distance between now and then, but also a distance between that culture's influence in this moment and your culture, your own? That think about the yeah. reparation, what is being repaired? What's being repaired? Um, so, you know, I think in one way, not, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm thinking aloud now, um, but uh, I think there's a kind of apology uh, or, or apologia yep. that tr uh, translation can uh, be a part of. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, you know, we, we can think of translating 
as building up our culture, uh, a, a sense of like kind of a consolidated Western identity and translating kind of you know, Greek and Roman uh, cl literary classics and things like that. But also I think there's a kind of very different kind of translation work that involves, um, you know, uh, meeting other cultures, marginalized cultures, uh, endangered languages um, and, uh, and uh, creating um, kind of meeting points or contact zones between them. And then there's a whole set of uh, problems associated with that uh, of appropriation or of um, colonization and exploitation and so on. You know, at this historical moment, we translate much more American literature and push it out into the world than we bring into this country, which says yes. something, huh? Yeah, and, you know, I think that um, there's also a, a kind of, there's a problem in the tra our translation culture of, like, expertise. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of, like, imperative that, like, we uh, translate accurately or yes, right. and so on. And one thing, for me, a big part of the book was doing a totally amateurish um, uh, translation that uh, is obviously unfaithful to the original. Uh, the translation in the book is a translation of an old Chinese tale. Uh, I don't know any Chinese, but I did find a French uh, translation of the story. Uh, so with my very poor French, uh, I started to um, try and bring the story that otherwise wouldn't be available to uh, English speakers or myself. Uh, into into uh, contemporary American English with all the kind of disasters that that entails. This mirrors the situation of the translation of much poetry. You know, where poems get translated, or completed at least by poets who don't speak the language of the original one. You know, have a trot or have a literal translation and take it from there to make a poem. Well, you know, sometimes you're glad that at least you have some kind of access to the poem, but it comes with limits. Yeah, and you know, I mean, this is an exciting time. You know, I said that, you know, American translation has a problem of mm -hmm. expertise, but actually there's also a time when really exciting experiments in translation are mm -hmm. happening, collaborative translations, um, uh, translations that uh, aren't thinking of themselves as uh, direct mm -hmm. um, right. mimetic yeah. reflections of what the original is, but rather um, use the original as a... a um, source uh, yeah, for yeah. a new, new literary expression. 